Hey friends, welcome back to the Journal Feed. My name is Nick Zelt, and this is the only place to get spoon-fed the latest and greatest of emergency medicine, where we want to keep you guys up on EM literature. And to do that, we spoon-feed it to you. Now, if you are hearing this right now, then you are not currently a Journal Feed subscriber, and so will not be receiving the full Journal Feed podcast, only getting a portion of the past week's articles. Don't worry, all good articles. But if you would like to get full access to both the podcast and the blog, then you'll have to become a member. All the details for that are at journalfeed.org. And remember, we never want money to be a barrier to better patient care. So if you're having any trouble affording a subscription, just get in touch. We'll help you out. Now, this is the audio version of the past week summaries, which were brought to you by our authors, Megan Hilbert, Samuel Rouleau, and Clay Smith. All right, let's just skip over to the third article. Titled, Are Contact Precautions Essential, air quotes, for the Prevention of Healthcare-Associated Methylene-Resistant Streptococcus Oris, out of the journal Clinical Infectious Diseases. Now, this paper is a critique of the SHEA IDSA APIC compendium on MRSA transmission in hospitals. Something important for us to consider. These authors agree with the compendium that contact precautions have a role to play in preventing the spread of MRSA. But should they be listed as essential practice, especially since these guidelines are not likely to be updated in something like the next 10 years? So here's what they had a problem with. They didn't like the strong wording of essential practice. There's not actually evidence to say that contact precautions are better than standard precautions of just good hand hygiene and usual cleaning. It makes plausible sense, of course, to have more precautions, but you shouldn't sound so certain when making non-evidence-based suggestions. Observational studies are not very clear on the matter, both supporting and refuting the efficacy of contact precautions. Now, when contact precautions have been included in RCTs, an impact has not been found over standard measures. I know there's always a strong urge to do something because it feels like it makes sense. Gosh, you can just take COVID as an example for that and all the weird precautions we put up. But anyways, but there are always consequences to doing things. Patients under contact precautions have fewer interactions with the healthcare team. People are frankly less likely to enter a room when they have to gown up in order to do so. This likely has downstream effects since contact precautions are associated with longer lengths of stay higher costs, and higher readmission rates. This could, of course, be confounded by many things, though. Don't forget PPE fatigue, though. It's exhausting to put on PPE between patients, and if you want staff to actually don and doff properly, then you should only have them doing it when it's actually necessary for them to do so, so that they take it seriously. In the emergency department, contact precautions make bed management eh, more difficult, and this can increase lengths of stay for everyone. And of course, lastly, the use of unneeded PPE means more waste, which is a greater environmental impact. The authors estimated that a universal contact precautions for MRSA in U.S. hospitals would use more than 1.5 billion gowns and gloves annually, which is more than half a million metric tons of carbon dioxide emissions, not to mention all the stuff that's going into landfills. So where do you stand on this? What is your hospital's policy? I agree with the authors here. That kind of waste and those consequences ought to be justified by evidence of benefit. People don't always consider both sides when they make these suggestions, unfortunately. In a spoonful, contact precautions for the prevention of MRSA transmission is called essential practice, but maybe we shouldn't think of it that way. And then the fourth article, titled Patient Factors Associated with Biased Language and Nightly Resident Verbal Handoff out of the JAMA Pediatrics. Now, we all know that handoff is kind of a dangerous thing. Things get forgotten or miscommunicated, and that can be bad for our patients. What's more, what you're told by the doctor handing over is definitely your first impression of the patient that you're going to be receiving. And we all know that first impressions can be kind of important. This study was a cross-sectional audio analysis of 302 internal medicine and pediatric resident patient handoffs coded for things that might introduce bias. This would include stereotypes, particularly negative ones, assigning blame to patients for their symptoms, and doubt, implying you don't believe a patient's reported experiences. This was actually quite prevalent. 23% of handoffs had some kind of biased language. Most common was blaming, then stereotyping, and lastly, doubt. Black race was positively associated with biased language, an odds ratio of 1.7. 
Since we're all likely probably guilty of this in some regard, it was good that the authors included some specific examples of things that were said. For instance, an immigrant was called a mail-order bride, which is certainly stereotyping. A patient was also blamed for a spine fracture from a car crash because they were drunk. Now, it's fair to mention alcohol use disorder, but I think that's a bit much to add during signover, maybe. Another patient's leaky ostomy was blamed on their obesity. As for doubt, a patient's 10 on 10 pain reported due to bunions was questioned, and someone else said that another patient had malingering type behavior. Now, I don't think any of us want to bias our colleagues. What we aim to do is give them an accurate representation of the patient that they're taking over. Our own Clay Smith's comment on this reminded me of something that I did as a medical student when I was on internal medicine. We would round as a team and include the patient in that team. So the summary, as well as everything that we discussed, was within earshot of the patient. Now I think that's a nice way to think of how you're signing over. Try to only say things that you wouldn't be embarrassed to have said in front of the patient. Keep in mind that these residents were likely aware that they were being recorded, and thus this could be them on their best behavior. Maybe they say more biased language when they don't think that they're being recorded. Also, this was internal medicine, and let's be honest, we stand a good chance of being less politically correct than our ward medicine colleagues. In a spoonful, this paper showed us how flawed signover can be and how easily we can insert our biases. Okay, that's all our articles from this week. Let's do our wrap-up. The third article didn't leave me very enthusiastic about contact precautions for MRSA prevention. Frankly, less donning and doffing I have to do, the better. Please reserve it for cases when it's actually needed. From the fourth article, try to keep signover objective. I think we can all agree that stereotypes, blame, and doubt have no place in our handoffs. Again, if you're hearing this right now, it's because you're not part of the members feed, so you missed three articles from this past week. From one article, we talked about alpha-gal and how it can cause anaphylaxis. Second, even opioids like loperamide can still be deadly. And from the last article, we talked about the evidence behind transfusion cutoffs. Links to all the articles summarized can be found at journalfeed.org, where the newsletter is the best way to make the podcast into a bite-sized nugget of space repetition. Our goal here is for you to read less, learn more, and save lives, one spoonful at a time. Thank you.